Let us say together the prayer for the fourth Sunday of Advent, found in the uh, bulletin. O key of David and scepter of the house of Israel, that openest and no man shutteth, and shuttest and no man openeth, come and bring the prisoner out of the prison, and him that seateth in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, became man as at this holy time, that we might become sons and daughters of God, grant, we beseech thee, that being made partakers of the divine nature of thy Son, we may be conformed to his likeness, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, now and ever. Amen. All right. The Lord be with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And this is what we read in the epistle. Indeed, the Lord is at hand. Tonight, we will celebrate the incarnation of our Lord at his first coming. And today, this morning, with it, the parousia, the coming again of Christ. The second is surely shadowed in the first, and the first is the promise and assurance of the second. The Lord is at hand. Let me explain. Maybe you don't know what this means. Certainly many people today don't, really. They don't know about the second coming of Christ beyond maybe some misguided notions or have been put off, put off by fearful accounts of the end of days. But we are convinced of better things. In my recent comments over the last few weeks, I've focused not on the end of things, but on the beginning of things, the new beginning to be exact. Because on the other side of the trials and tribulations at the end of the age, which I am convinced will be a relatively short time, is the beauty of the age to come. Something wonderful is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And this is good news. It is beautiful news and part of the Christmas story. Good news of great joy we Christians have about the destiny of mankind 
As I've said before, we have a better story than the one the world tells. There's this dismal. The, world, the story the world tells is hopeless and dark. We not, over ha- not only have a better story, we have the most beautiful story. Our story is better not only because it's true, but because it's more beautiful. We proclaim the Lord is at hand forever and always. At his first coming, the Lord is at hand. After his resurrection from the grave, the Lord is at hand. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is at hand. And with his coming again, the Lord is at hand. Whenever we pray, the Lord is at hand. Whenever we gather together to worship him, the Lord is at hand. And when we receive the Holy Eucharist, the body and blood of our Lord, the Lord is at hand. What does it mean for us, the Lord is at hand? Well, far more than the fact that he was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, as if that wasn't enough. But more than he is with us, by the Holy Spirit now, as important as that is, it means that on his return, he will be nearer to us than ever. As near as two persons, intimate and betrothed and married. And what's more beautiful than a wedding? The Lord is at hand is the hopeful declaration that Christ comes to set the world right not first about the judgment of the world that will occur. Surely the wicked will be removed from the earth as part of the plan, but rather it's about the consummation of a marriage. Scripture and the church call it the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great wedding feast. Time and again in the Gospels, our Lord uses the image of a wedding to describe his return. For example, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. The Lord is at hand. The bridegroom is near. Do you have oil in your lamps? Can you see it? This language points to something far more beautiful, of course, than oil or a trim lamp. It styles the return of Christ as a wedding between man and God. The joining of a man and a woman declare a much deeper reality and a more beautiful destiny for all of humanity. As a picture of things to come, it reveals the marriage between God and humankind, just as a wedding between a husband and a wife is an icon of this heavenly marriage. We have been betrothed to God at the incarnation, and our marriage will be consummated at his return. The destiny of humanity is to be joined together into one community with God. Human destiny does not end with oblivion. We don't blow ourselves up. We are united to God in a forever marriage, joined as one family, together with the angels, by the way. But there are others who would deny us this wedding. The world we inhabit is under a curse. The spell modern humanism casts pledges a future peace, but one that always seems to come at the expense of the weak. This philosophy, which is the belief that humans can be moral and noble without God and with any religious precept by reason and science, is seated like an antichrist in the halls of power. Their story is rife with criticisms and objections about all that is wrong in the world and full of arrogant solutions born from ideologies that hide within their fair-sounding reason a poison 
that, like the evil queen's apple, lays humanity in a bed-like tomb. Those under the spell are like Snow White, half asleep and half dead. Humanism will not save the world. There is no human institution worthy of breaking the curse because it's not love that moves them, but like the evil queen, fear. And fear has no beauty in it and only leads to spiritual poverty. There's no story more beautiful than the mystery of the incarnation. The beauty of the Christmas story is that God has taken to himself human flesh and bone, carried by the Virgin Mary alone, born in Bethlehem, crucified, died, and buried, risen from the dead to save us from dread, bestowing his spirit to all that will hear it, the good news that God and man are made one and the marriage supper of the Lamb is come. Humanism tells no such story. There is no marriage supper between God and man. It promises instead something more sterile. Mankind married to itself as if mankind were sufficient in itself to raise itself to the next level. But mankind has fallen, and we see the proof of this every day, even more so now. And we've multiplied technologies only to create new fears. We pretend to master the world while it is clear we are unable to rise above the same impulses that destroy us. Humanists pr promise, a world, promise the world a golden age but only deliver a dark age time and again. They promise a marriage supper where insects and plant-based meat are put on the banquet table and offer a clone for a spouse. A humanistic destiny like this, embraced and promoted by people in power, is falsely elevated to the status of a celestial marriage. If we allow it, we are left in humanism's cold, dark winter under the spell of Jadis, the White Witch of Narnia. Make no mistake, there are people who have betrothed you to the state. The Antichrist would wed humanity to itself rather than God. The current real icon of this marriage should not escape your imagination. This humanistic vision is willing to sacrifice you to achieve its goals. They will not take your place and die for you, but they will happily take your life and have you die for their false promise. They hold out the apple. Will you bite? But this is not the way of divine love, which is always self-giving. And a marriage like this we cannot bless. The Lord is at hand, and he will make his bride glorious. The marriage of God and man is the story of his glory freely shared with the other, not merely duplicated in himself. God has not cloned or copied himself so that he can have a relationship with himself. But in mankind has made another different enough not to be God, but alike enough to genuinely share all of the important moral attributes that make God, God, us. He has made us for a bride. Different enough not to be God, but alike enough to genuinely share all the important moral attributes that make God, God. This is why God can elevate us through the incarnation. We are different enough from God to exist apart from him and for ourselves, of course, separate from him. Separation from him is possible. Isolation, loneliness, despair. 
as well as humanism, which is ultimately a narcissistic betrothal to self. The beauty that saves the world is the betrothal to God instituted in the incarnation in which all creation becomes the bridal chamber and all of humanity is mystically and really joined to God. This wedding is incarnated and initiated in the incarnation and fulfilled when he comes to claim his bride in the ultimate sublimation or raising up of everything to God. Through the incarnation and by his rising again, the destiny of mankind is set. We, beloved, are betrothed to God because God has entered our world and taken up our nature within his own and has thereby raised us up, divinizing it and marking the way in his own flesh for human beings to be transformed more and more into the divine image. Beloved, let us live as children of the light. The Lord is at hand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We offer unto thee, O Lord, the cup of salvation, humbly beseeching thy mercy, and we go 